So we talked about this already. Some people, including someone at Hoover, once did an estimate of what would happen if we had a legalization. There are about 10 or 11 million unauthorized immigrants in America. What if we legalized them? What would happen? And what if we did this in 2010 and then looked a decade ahead? It takes five years to apply for citizenship once you're a legal permanent resident. Well, his finding was that Democrats would gain an advantage, but it would be a 0.06 to 0.4 percentage point. So in other words, much less than a percentage point in the national vote. And it really wouldn't affect any state other than Florida, where it might turn it into a, a toss-up state. So for all this talk about how you have these sort of geographical metaphors, waves of Latinos and other immigrants who are potentially going to come into the electorate and sort of dramatically change it, even under the most you know, classical or current liberal kind of program that allowed a legalization of 10 million people, the electoral effects would be hardly there at all. We've already talked about a couple of these things. One exception to this is Indiana in 2008. Latino voters probably swung Indiana. There are almost no Indianas in the data. Latino voters probably put Indiana over the top for Obama. McCain would have won without them, but there are so few Indianas that this is pretty much it in terms of states that Latino voters have swung. And I also don't have time, but I would talk about how the California story is a little more complicated than people say. People talk about how, well, you know, the Republican Party alienated Latinos and other immigrants in the 1990s, and they swung heavily behind the Democratic Party and forever changed the politics of the state. You know, that story is not quite true. There's a whole variety of complications that were going on at the same time. It wasn't all Latinos who responded in 1990 to the politics of the time. It was pretty much the foreign-born non-citizens. It wasn't the native-born Latino population. In other words, the population that is predominantly the voters of the state. There are other things that were going on, like the end of the Cold War, the decline of the defense industry that uh, changed the population of Southern California. So there are a variety of things that were going on. It wasn't just that kind of simple story. Even when you see the argument of, well, you know, these new Latino millennials, aren't they all sort of super liberal? Aren't they socialist? Aren't they going to just change everything around? Well, millennials are making up a larger share of the Latino electorate, as we can see. But a recent study that just came out, I think last week, looked at uh, Latino college students in the RGV, the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas, and found that they actually weren't all that liberal. In fact, they were more conservative or especially libertarian than people think. So even when we're talking about the ideology of these new voters, they're clearly, it seems, I mean, this is tentative evidence, but I've seen other evidence, they're clearly interested in other possibilities. They're not just the sort of liberal Democrats of the political imagination. The Cato Institute is also I think been pleased to find that Latinos are interested in libertarianism. So they had a, libertarians are more racially diverse than some may realize. This was a Pew and YouGov survey. Uh, also a Fox News poll found that this was before the presidential election. Latinos are twice as likely to support the libertarian candidate. They didn't end up doing so, just like libertarian candidates often find their support declining at the very end when you see the two parties saying, don't waste your vote, vote for one of us, vote for one of the monopoly parties. Uh, but Latinos were interested before that in exploring alternatives uh, to the two presidential candidates. Are Latinos Republicans or Democrats, well, why are they one or the other? Well, a graduate student of mine did, so, did a dissertation where she looked at open-ended codings. How did people respond in their own words in uh, major surveys to descriptions of the political parties? Well, what she found that it was all sort of like in New Deal terms, you know, taxing the rich, social programs for the common person, uh, you know, is the Republican or the Democratic Party for the, like, you know, the elites or the mass or it's all this kind of classic New Deal, bread and butter kind of socioeconomic things. It's not about uh, social issues, cultural issues. It wasn't about abortion. It wasn't about any of these kinds of issues like that. It was all about this. And this is actually good news for the Republican Party that the that Latino voters see it, the party in these terms because as Latinos become more successful, as the acculturation data clearly shows, they are becoming more successful. They're becoming more educated. They're having greater incomes. They're having higher level jobs. And as they do that, they become more Republican, just like past waves of migrants became more Republican. So you know, this acculturation news is actually uh, really good for two-party competition in the United States. And I'm not going to say very much more because I want to leave some time for questions, but we've also seen that there are different ways different political candidates have shown that they can attract more or fewer uh, Latino voters. Actually, if you look at who are the most socially conservative, this is an interesting fact, the most socially conservative Latinos are foreign-born non-citizens. So the population that isn't voting is actually the most conservative in these terms. Uh, 
If you look at the political parties, this is an old chart, but I, I really need to, I didn't do this, but I like the colors and I just need to update it, but I've never quite gotten around to it. But in any case, this shows that some people think that the Latino vote is just sort of automatically going more and more and more and more to the Democratic Party, but this actually shows in a nice graphic way that it's not, it goes back and forth, it depends on the times. And this actually corresponds pretty heavily with how American voters on the whole are voting. So when Republicans do well among white, and all voters, they do well among Latinos. When they do less well, then they do less well among Latinos. So these are like parallel roller coasters that are like separated by a gap, a voting gap, but they're nevertheless moving in tandem, which tells you that Latinos are responding to the real politics of the times just like everybody else is. They're not this unique population that we can't possibly understand because they're, they're strangely attracted to socialism or something or other. No, they're responding to politics just like everybody else is. You see the same thing too with national voting patterns. Uh, on the bottom and Latino voting patterns on the top as far as partisan vote goes. They go up and down, they go up and down in, in tandem. To the degree that there's a politics out there that's, uh, that's anti-immigrant or at least skeptical of immigration, uh, there are certainly some kind of collateral effects beyond Latino voters. So I've done some research on this showing that moderate white voters uh, who, were, uh, who thought that George W. Bush was more sympathetic to Latinos were actually more likely to support him. So you have a sort of moderate white vote that might otherwise be attracted to the GOP, but is not necessarily very excited by politics uh, that suggests that it might be anti-immigrant. You've also got Asian American voters, a group that I said is almost never talked about. But did you know that three quarters of Asian Americans voted for Ronald Reagan in 1984? Did you know that three quarters of Asian Americans voted for Hillary Clinton? in 2016, actually more than three quarters. It was the group she did the best in, aside from African Americans. This is an incredible turnaround. I mean, how many other groups can you think have switched from three quarters one side to three quarters another? Now, it's not like it's the exact same people because there's been lots of migration, there's been lots of changes in, in who's coming and where they're coming from, so there are qualifications to this story. But nevertheless, the Asian American population is more heavily tied to the migration experience than Latinos are in terms of the percentage of immigrants and children of immigrants. So when we're talking about immigration politics, Asian Americans are significantly affected. And this shows you some of the trends about how Latino migration has actually been in decline and how Asian American uh, migration has been on the, on the rise. And this is an important point to keep in when we're thinking about demographic change. And so I'll just conclude that these, uh, these, these metaphors matter, that the media love these kind of scary geological metaphors. Uh, there was a whole book written about this, about how the LA Times describes uh, migration. And it's always these sort of scary, negative kind of things, waves, earthquakes, floods, tides. I mean, none of this is good, right? You know, nobody wants an earthquake. I'm a native Californian. I've lived through a couple of earthquakes. Nobody wants those things. But the truth is actually much less dramatic, much less, as I said, like plate tectonics. You have the Latino and minority populations are growing, but they're growing steadily. The cumulative effect is going to be large, but it's not large in any given year. The political implications, as I've said, are unclear. We don't really know how this is going to turn out. There are a lot of complications to this whole demography as destiny, everything from the fundamentals of politics to acculturation to location. There are just so many factors going on here that it's hard to say how a group, even a large group, is really going to somehow dramatically transform American politics. And I think critically, the decisions that are made today about how to respond to these uh, changing demographics are going to be critical to the politics to tomorrow. How are the parties going to respond? So in conclusion, the fundamentals matter, the candidates matter, geographies matter, issues matter, outreach matters. Now, a lot of Democrats, as you've probably seen, are optimistic about this story. They think that this is what is going to inevitably happen, so all they have to do is kind of sit tight, and even if they have a few losses today in politics, they know that the future is bright and there will be an inevitable string of Democratic victories, and maybe the Republicans will have a few Senate seats, but that on the whole, victory will be theirs. On the other hand, there are a lot of Republicans who believe this story too. They just believe it in a negative way, like, uh-oh, you know, demography is changing. This is gonna be a real huge problem for us. You know, maybe we need to respond to this in some kind of way, or maybe we need to double down in an opposite kind of way. But I think that as uh, you know, Barra73, also known as Yogi Barra, who said, you know, it's, it ain't over till it's over. And so I think well, I'll leave you with that thought right there.